All right, it is two minutes after the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. So thanks so much, everyone, for joining today. Uh, it's been a while since, since we've done one of these. Uh, we're going to ramp back up in the new year, but really, really happy to have everyone uh, joining this session today. So um, on the line, you have myself, uh, Nick Gaskia, lead client enablement at Kaleido, and we also have Jim Zhang, uh, one of the founders of the company, uh, and also um, a rather prolific contributor to all things Hyperledger Fabric, uh, former maintainer um, during his time at IBM. So Jim, Jim has led the vast majority of all of the work uh, around Fabric uh, in Kaleido and also in an open source project, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit here. Um, so the agenda for today, uh, whoops, skipped one. Um, I'm going to basically just give you a quick overview of Kaleido. We'll hop into the console and we'll create, you know, a fabric environment, show you how easy it is to do. Uh, we'll look at some smart contract management um, with some Go-based chain code. Uh, and then we'll look at a couple of uh, sample uh, SDK-based apps, uh, Node.js and, and Go SDK. Uh, and then we'll transition to Jim and Jim will show you how you can talk to Fabric on Kaleido using this open source component that we call Fab Connect. Uh, it has striking similarities to something that has existed in Kaleido for a long time called ETH Connect, which a lot of people might be familiar with, uh, and it's part of the open source Firefly project. So we'll we'll look at you know sort of the classic approach to talking to Fabric with SDKs uh, and kind of this new bleeding edge approach that uh, is accessible to developers you know of all shapes and sizes, just REST APIs. Um, okay, so Kaleido. What is Kaleido? A lot of people probably are already familiar with the platform, but for any newcomers, uh, I'll just run through it. So we are built for modern business networks, completely use case and industry agnostic. Uh, we run production consortia across trade finance, insurance, supply chain, healthcare, you name it. Um, people that have used the product will already know this, um, but as we look at it, it's radically simple, both through the user interface and both programmatically, right? I just alluded to REST APIs with Fabric, um, but there's actually a REST API for everything inside of Kaleido, whether it's, you know, speaking, you know, from an application to your blockchain network, or whether it's doing, you know, sort of more admin operations and scripting. Uh, and then the third tenet is that we're built for the enterprise. So really important stuff around key management, around cloud hosting, around high availability, disaster recovery, business continuity, you know, the hundreds of things on that InfoSec requirement checklist. Uh, Kaleido has an answer for all of those, uh, many of which are just baked into the platform as first class citizens. Um, so we run on multiple clouds, um, so you're not locked into a specific cloud vendor out of the box for your fully managed hosting. You have AWS, you have Microsoft Azure, uh, and then you have your choice of all of the big three enterprise blockchain protocols, uh, Enterprise Ethereum, R3 Corda, uh, and now Hyperledger Fabric, the third to join the platform. Um, you'll see that it's a really rich user interface, right? So it's, you know, a digital transformation platform and it's a consortia as a service. So all of the management, all of the dashboards, all of the different views that a program or, or an admin operator would need, uh, they're very, very easy to access and very easy to make sense of inside of the platform. Uh, and then lastly, last slide, I promise, and then I'll hop into the platform. Um, one really distinct thing is sort of the um, I guess the bifurcation or the compartmentalization of ownership of resources in the platform. So you have the high level control plane, which makes it really easy to decentralize your network, bring on new participants. You have a shared collaboration zone, right, for blockchain transactions or maybe for off chain encrypted messaging. Uh, and then you have your own specific bucket. You have your member plane, right? And this is where you can do really cool integrations with, you know, maybe services you have in your own cloud account, like key management or storage services. Um, so you can see sort of how this, you know, goes up the ladder or goes down the ladder very logically. Uh, and you'll see that in the platform here momentarily. So I'm going to stop sharing these slides and we'll get into the exciting stuff here. Okay, so first I'm just going to go ahead and log into the platform. Uh, and we'll just start by creating a basic Hyperledger fabric network here. Um, we're going to go ahead and stand up some certificate authorities, we'll stand up some ordering nodes, and then we'll stand up some peers. Uh, and you'll see that, you know, this is a matter of, you know, two minutes probably max for us to have, you know, a fully baked, fully stable Hyperledger fabric environment where you don't have to do anything except click a couple buttons in the console or call our administrative APIs. So um, forgive me, I'm going to have to move this Zoom bar um, multiple times, I'm sure 
anyone else that's you know done screen sharing or a presentation can empathize with me um so if i if i have to stop and drag something for a few seconds just uh, bear with me so we're going to go ahead and create a business network or a consortium i'm going to call this tech tuesday um and whatever the date is uh one four right here First thing I'll do is I'll pick my cloud provider in the underlying region. So this will be our home region, and it'll also whitelist uh, this cloud in this region to be able to host nodes and host services. Uh, and as I mentioned, Kaleido is not going to limit you to a specific cloud or a specific region because we recognize that you know modern business networks are very diverse. So if you have you know a certain participant that's an Azure shop and a certain participant that's an AWS shop, uh, they can both easily integrate with their existing backend cloud estates uh, and they can both participate on Kaleido. All that low level layer two networking is completely handled under the covers by Kaleido. I'm going to stick with just AWS in the states for this one um, for simplicity. Okay, so here's the wrapper. Here's sort of like the top level resource in Kaleido, our business network. Uh, we can click on this governance tab and we'll see that my organization, Org123, gets the first membership, right? That just happens by default. So if your organization was named My Company Organization or Org ABC, you would see that it automatically gets the first membership inside of a business network. Now for Fabric, we wanna mock out multiple participants. We want multiple nodes to endorse you know, transactions. Uh, so I'm gonna add another membership and we'll bind a certificate authority and an order and a node to this new membership that I create. I'll just call it org four five six. So now we have two memberships and we can start getting into the fun stuff and actually create our Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. We call that an environment inside of Kaleido. So I'll go here and click this add environment button. I'm gonna go through the standard blockchain service store. Uh, Jim will likely talk more about Firefly, which is um, the new open source library that we've donated to Hyperledger. Um, but for my portion of the demo, I'm gonna just take you through kind of a vanilla Hyperledger fabric environment here. Um, so we see the big three choices. I'll go with fabric, click next. And now I just need to create a name for my blockchain or for my environment. Um, so I'll just call it I don't know, like Tuesday demo environment right here. Uh, I'm gonna go with the cloud only hosted orchestration. But um, if you're on the line and you know you have really austere um, security requirements, you know for your organization, and you need to run a fabric node or an Ethereum node um, or some other component on premise, uh, there is support for a service we have called Private Stack. So um, we'll, we'll share all the contact details, um, and you can get in touch with us, and we can talk more about that. Um, there are some you know sort of requirements in order to run the Private Stack, but um, it is something that we have and that we do support. Um, for this demo, I'll be going cloud only. Uh, and lastly, we're just going to choose sort of the, you know, the, the version and the algorithm, both defaulting to 2.3 and Raft. Cool. Okay, so now we have our second resource. We have a child resource of our business network that we've called an environment. Uh, right now, again, just an empty namespace with Hyperledger Fabric 2.3 and Raft consensus. Uh, now we want to bring it to life by creating some orders and creating the, you know, subsequent CAs. So I'll create my first order node right here. Just call it orderer one, two, three. Uh, we see here that I'm asked to choose the deployment region. Since I didn't whitelist any additional clouds or regions, this is my only choice. If I had added Azure or additional AWS regions, we'd see a more robust drop down right here. Okay, um, so now I need to create the CA for that membership as well. Uh, it's going to default to the name of my membership and just CA. That's perfect. We'll click next. Uh, and now we have a quick screen here. Not going to spend too much time, but uh, I mentioned sort of in that kind of you know low level organizational ownership plane, right? When we looked at uh, the topology chart, that you have the ability to weave in stuff that's in your private cloud account: AWS KMS, AWS S3 buckets, CloudWatch, uh, AWS Private. Link. So if you want to sort of extend or heighten security with any of these um, integration pieces, this is very easy to, you know, sort of do at this point or do after the fact. You have full, full autonomy, full control over any of the configurations, attaching them, removing them, updating them, etc. Um, you're obviously the admin of all of these resources, so you can choose to use as many or as few as you want. Uh, and then the lastly, the last thing we need to do here is just choose the the t-shirt size of the node. Um, we're going to be doing really trivial transactions against the uh, basic asset transfer chain code, so uh, a small node will more than suffice. Okay. 
So now I'm going to speed up and I'm going to go ahead and add another order node for my second membership right here, 456. So we'll call this order 456, just like the other one, put it in AWS US East, same name, and click next, click next, and click finish. Okay, so this will take about uh, maybe a minute or so for these guys to fully bootstrap. Uh, and you can see that you know all of the really hard things, all of the low level stuff in Fabric around MSPs and around creating channels, around bootstrapping and you know life cycle chain codes, uh, all of that is gonna just be done by Kaleido under the covers for you. So you can immediately get to the place that matters the most which is iterating on your business logic, on your chain code, hardening that, and then really spending your money or your engineering cycles on putting a beautiful interface and a beautiful application on top of it. Um, so as these are going up, I'm gonna take you through sort of what we'll be doing, um, what, what assets we'll be using here. So in our public GitHub library, um, there is a repo, repo called Kaleido Fabric Samples, um, and it has, three um, very, very, very usable apps using the three SDKs that exist in Hyperledger Fabric, Node, Go, and Java. Um, there's a basic example for all of these. I'm gonna take you through Go and Node today. Um, maybe on a future webinar, we'll, we'll look into Java. Um, and then we're gonna leverage um, in the actual root Hyperledger directory, um, not owned by Kaleido, um, the Fabric Samples directory. Um, so we're gonna just use this asset transfer um, basic asset transfer chain code right here. Uh, and we'll use the Go implementation of that. Um, so that's kind of um, the assets that we'll be using. Uh, and then we'll be using our smart contract management feature uh, to actually do kind of the promotion and the iteration and the change management, version management on Kaleido. So let's hop back here. We can see that these guys have started. Uh, our last order node is initializing. And once these guys come up, we're gonna go ahead and stand up uh, the corresponding peer nodes. Uh, I should mention that if there are any questions, um, we will save some time. We'll try to save about five to 10 minutes uh, after the call to take any live questions. Um, but please feel free to throw them into the chat. Um, you know, Jim can answer if they're, you know, fabric specific, if it's more just Kaleido in general, we have some other folks online that are happy to answer. Um, so both of these guys stood up. Now we want to create two peer nodes. Uh, and this is this uh, default channel that we're creating. Uh, we'll go ahead and look at all of the policies, but we want two peer nodes because the, the chain code policy by default is set to majority. So we need to collect both of these signatures right here for the peer nodes. So I'm gonna create one for this membership, just call it peer one, two, three. And then I'm gonna create another for uh, the four, five, six membership as well. Uh, and, and you see the option to you know, integrate those cloud services directly into the peers as well. So add peer node, switch the membership, and we'll call those peer four, five, six. Okay, so these guys are coming up now. And while they're initializing, what we'll do is we'll jump into the smart contract management feature. So I can go to my network view right here and I can go to apps. And what we wanna do is we wanna create a new namespace. We wanna create a new app. Uh, we used to call these contract projects. Um, app is probably a more representative term. Um, the beautiful thing here is that inside of this application wrapper, you can have many, many versions of your chain code or of your solidity if we we're using an Ethereum environment. Uh, meaning that it becomes really, really easy uh, and really transparent for you to iterate uh, and, and integrate sort of with your existing change management systems. You have very transparent line of sight for everyone else in the network. So I'm gonna create a Hyperledger Fabric application namespace, call it asset transfer, because that's the, the chain code we're gonna use. And I'm gonna use a pre-compiled Golang executable, um, also supports a, a tarred up or a zipped up uh, Node.js project. Um, the simple binary is, is a lot more straightforward for me. Okay, so this didn't do much. All we did is say, this is gonna be a fabric project and it's gonna be um, you know, a dot bin extension, a binary file. So now we need to actually create a new version of this, right? So I'm gonna click create new version and it's saying, okay, where's that binary file? So I'm gonna grab something off of my local machine. Okay, so bear with me here. I'm gonna add another terminal. So first we want to 
um, we want to build this chain code right here. So what I've done is I've cloned that fabric samples repo uh, in the hyperledger directory, uh, and I've hopped into the asset transfer chain code go directory right here. So what we want to do is we want to go ahead and create that binary. So we're going to say the operating system is Linux. We're going to say the architecture is 64 bit. And then I just need to say go build and choose some arbitrary name and we'll call it asset transfer dot um, So uh, I should also mention that, you know, to use both of these samples um, or to create, you know, a pre-compiled Go binary, uh, you will need Go on your system and to use, you know, the Node.js Node application, you'll need Node and NPM on your system as well. Um, so this all looks good. Let's go ahead and build that and this will spit us out the binary file, which we can then upload to Kaleido. Uh, and actually create our first version, right? So let's check that it's there, it's right here. So we can hop back into Kaleido, we can say select file, I can move the zoom bar again, and here's asset transfer.bin built today. So I'll go ahead and open that and we can click finish right here. Uh, and what we'll see here in a, in a few seconds is we'll see that we have uh, a new version, right? Well, we have this um, version number one of the asset transfer chain code right here, right? 1.0.0. Uh, and we can see this notification that, okay, cool, you gave us something that compiled properly that Glido can make sense of. Uh, now you need to tell us which environment it wants to go to, right? And so now you can you can sort of see the idea here in terms of a CI CD or a DevOps pipeline. You can have multiple application namespaces, many, many versions inside of each of them. And then you can create multiple environments in Kaleido. You can have a sandbox or a UAT environment, you know, really, really harden this chain code. And then, you know, once it's behaving exactly as you expect it is, once your application is working beautifully, you can then promote that chain code to another environment. And very, very little has to change, you know, sort of inside of any server code that you've written. You just need to point towards a different peer. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and promote this to the environment. I can use this button or I can use this ellipsis right here. So we'll go ahead and promote it. I only have a single environment. And so we'll go ahead and click finish. And now we can deploy this instance to the channel. Before we do that, let's go ahead and make sure our peers are up and cooking. They are, so we can click on a peer. We can see the logs. We can see all of the really unpleasant things that happen in Fabric that are just taken care of for you for free on Kaleido. So you have a fully bootstrapped network here that took about two and a half minutes maybe end to end. So let's go back, let's go back down to our apps right here, go to our chain code, and let's go ahead and deploy it to the channel. Uh, we are not gonna require a knit ledger um, before we invoke it. Um, so this will be immediately accessible as soon as we instantiate it onto the channel. Cool. So it's live. We can go back and click on one of our peers, and we should see a lifecycle notification uh, that this chain code is ready for endorsements, that it's ready for invocations. Um, we can take a quick peek at that, and then we'll jump into the apps. Okay, so blah, 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 blah. We're looking for a lifecycle flag right here, which... Um, <laughs> I'm going to struggle to find, but it's in here somewhere. Um, it should tell us that there's a chain code with an ID that's ready for invocation. Okay, so this is good right here. These are these are the types of things that we're looking for, basically. That um, that they should be right in the middle of the screen. You just scroll past it, right there. <laughs> it's the one with the long hash, right there. Isn't it? It's right in front of me. Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm just, when I stare at logs, I can never see it. Yeah. Okay, G Jim's- Three lines, Jim's, three lines three, down. Three lines down, one, two, three. That one, that one. Um, the last okay. life cycle. The last life cycle, query definition, query- yeah, go, go back up. <laughs> down, down, three more, that one, that one, that one, life cycle. That one, that one. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. It was it was right in front of my face the entire time. Okay, so this is, thanks Jim, appreciate it. Your, your eyes are better than mine. Um, so this is just letting us know that, hey, this chain code is ready for invocations right here. So yeah, look, uh, that's, that's useful, Jim. Look for, look for the unique hash for, the, for this, um, you know, specific uh, chain code instance right here. Okay, so these are ready and now we can hop into the applications. Uh, and like I said, we'll be using the Go application uh, and the Node.js application and they are, doing lawn work outside of my home. So apologize for any background noise. 
Um, okay, so let's hop back and let's take a look at the two applications that we're going to use. So the one requirement um, that we need for these applications is they need to be able to talk to Kaleido. They need to be able to learn about the resources, learn about our environment, learn about the peers and the certificate authorities. Uh, and for that, we need an administrative API key. Um, this is what allows you to to do any CRUD operations on Kaleido. Uh, and this is something that's specific to your Kaleido account, your Kaleido organization. So we just need to throw this out as an environment variable um, into, uh, into the different you know, project directories where we're gonna be calling this from. So let's go ahead and create an API key. So I'm gonna switch my directories here. I'm gonna go do the Golang uh, sample first. Um, so CD Kaleido fabric sample, CD Go right here. You can see what's in here. Uh, again, this is KFG is the executable. You will need Go installed on your machine in order to build it. Um, I don't believe I have anything uh, exported, any variables here. I might, okay, so I have an old API key. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new one so you guys can see how that's done. So inside of Kaleido, if you click this user icon in the lower left, you'll see the option for profile settings. So I'm gonna click profile settings, API keys. Uh, and again, these are, these are really, really powerful. These are admin bearer tokens. So if you have an API key, you can delete resources, you can update and cycle application credentials, you can resize your node, uh, you can remove configurations. So these need to be treated um, you know, with, with a lot of security, with you know, very, very diligent consideration. Um, and since mine was shown on the screen and this is recorded, I'll actually even delete this API key right here and we'll go ahead and generate a new one. So I'll just call this example key. And this is ephemeral, right? This is just like the security credentials we use in Kaleido, meaning you're gonna see it one time and it's a salt hash verification on the back end on the Kaleido side. So uh, when you see the API key or you see your application credentials, uh, you need to copy it. If you don't, you'll need to regenerate it after the fact. So we'll go ahead and copy this one, click close. And I'll just say export API key equals that string right there, okay? We'll clear this, give ourselves a little more space, uh, and then we can just go ahead and run this program. Uh, what it's going to do inside of the Go example is it's going to register and enroll a user as a type of client. Uh, it'll be user number one, uh, and then it's going to invoke that asset transfer chain code uh, and call the create asset method. Uh, we can take, let's just take a quick look at, at what it's going to do. So if we go into the chain code directory, uh, and actually look at all the logic, what we'll see these programs calling is this method right here, this create asset method. Um, once Jim starts showing you Fab Connect and the REST APIs, um, we will look at you know, more of the exciting methods in, inside of this piece of chain code, like reading, updating, transferring, deleting, et cetera. Uh, all I'm gonna show you is just using the SDKs and calling this create asset method. Okay, so we've exported the API key. Uh, and we can go ahead and kick off this program right here. So, okay, so using that API key, it automatically detects um, all of the stuff that I have in Kaleido, all of my business networks, uh, all of my resources. And it's saying, hey, which consortium, which business network do you wanna use? And we wanna use this guy right here, the one that I just created, number two. So we'll go ahead and click that. Uh, it's going to say, hey, which MSP identity do you want to create this transaction with? How do you want to you know, sort of manifest this invocation of that chain code? Uh, so we'll originate it with org123, uh, and we'll be able to see that when we look at the transaction. We'll be able to see who endorsed it, and we'll be able to see these associated membership IDs as well. Okay, so it's auto detecting all of this. It's building that common configuration profile uh, and it's sending in you know, a transaction to call that create asset method. Uh, really, really simple, really straightforward. Uh, now what we can do, we can go back into Kaleido and we can start visualizing this transaction. We can start visualizing what happened with our new, with our new member, uh, with that register and, and enroll call that happened under the covers um, behind the scenes. Um, Okay, so let's go back into our environment right here. We can go ahead and click on one of our nodes, our peer node, and we can go ahead and open up the web UI right here. So this is the open source Hyperledger Explorer component. We just need to give it the username and the associated password.
Okay, so we see that we have one chain code in the network and we have 10 total transactions, uh, the vast majority of which, nine to be specific, were all of those system calls. Um, so we can click on our transactions tab uh, and we see here that um, you know, all the other ones were lifecycle or configurations on our default channel. Uh, and here we have the inter interesting one, the actual invocation of that asset transfer chain code. So we can click on this and we can see additional IDs, right? Uh, and here we see this was org123. This is its membership ID in Kaleido. And this is the membership ID for um, org456, right? And remember, this needed a, a majority endorsement. So we had to collect those signatures um, from both of these identities. Uh, and this is really easy to map back to that membership object right here. This NZM. So if we go back to Kaleido, we click our dashboard, we click on the address book right here and look at the memberships. If I look at the membership details for this guy right here, org123, we see that that's exactly what we're seeing inside of the Hyperledger Explorer, right? We see that same string. If I clicked on org456's membership, I would see this as its membership ID. Um, so you can peruse through the Hyperledger Explorer as much or as little as you want, see the channels that you have. We just have our default channel, see the chain codes that you have, um, just asset transfer. But, you know, as you, as you start sending more transactions into the network, you know, you start deploying and instantiating more chain codes, uh, this becomes a much richer, more robust experience. Okay, um, so let's see what else it did. Um, in addition to invoking, what we needed was an actual wallet. We needed a client identity. So it also enrolled um, that user that we have. So if we go ahead and look at the identities, we'll see that, oh, I had exported uh, user, user 02 as my user ID. So um, it defaults to user number one um, as, a, as a type of client. Um, you can override that environment variable and specify um, your own string that you want. So I'll go ahead and export our next user using the node program. Uh, we'll call him user 03. Um, so this is more or less what happened uh, under the covers with, with this program right here, the Golang executable. Um, so now we can switch and we can go to the node program. Um, which is right here. And again, the only core requirement is that you install the modules and you export that environment variable. Uh, you can choose to, you know, sort of add additional environment variables, one of which I'll add is, an, is a specific user ID. Um, but for the, for the most part, you know, this program is just going to do, you know, every piece of lifting that you need. Okay, so back into our terminal, I will clear all of this and we can go back to node. So, is it node. so I've installed all the modules and all I need to do is export a new user ID. Uh, we'll call this one user 03. Make sure we still have our API key. Okay, so we should be good to go here. So we can go ahead and call this program. And we'll see a lot of similarities, right? It's gonna ask me to you know, enumerate the business network or the consortium. Again, that's number two right here. It's gonna say, hey, who do you wanna create this transaction with? I'll go with membership one, two, three again. And now it's gonna discover all of the resources, right? Similar to that Go program. It's gonna do you know, building that CCP, that common configuration profile, uh, asking me, do I want to call a knit ledger? If you remember, when we sort of built this contract project and we deployed the instance to the channel, we did not require that. So I can say no for this, uh, sitting at the bottom of my terminal, by the way, if people are struggling to see. Uh, and then lastly, it's going to go ahead and just generate a random unique ID for this asset. Uh, and it's going to, um, you know, create this object that's defined inside of that asset transfer chain code right there. Uh, and if we go back to the Explorer, we'll see a second transaction that's taken place inside of the system. Um, so this is kind of the the, the flavor of of how you go through um, go through the the fabric samples. Um, we can see our second transaction right here, um, again endorsed or created by organization one, two, three, uh, and then endorsed by both peers as well. So I think that's everything I wanted to show. Uh, the last thing I'll draw your attention to again is if we just go back to the apps right here and we click on this, if you want to make some changes, add a new method, you know, change a struct inside of the chain code, uh, all you do is, you know, implement that code change, make sure it compiles locally, et cetera. Uh, and then you can go ahead and say, hey, create new version and create version 10.1. Uh, inside of Kaleido and do the exact same thing. Just promote that to the 
uh, to the channel and deploy that new instance uh, and you're good to go. Um, so this is, this is how easy it is to sort of use Fabric on Kaleido. Uh, and again, the main responsibilities you know, on the client or on the user side uh, is really chain code, i.e. business logic, uh, and then whatever you're gonna put on top of it. Um, last thing I'll show for admins, um, we, you, you have a really rich health and monitoring dashboard. So you can see kind of the consumption CPU memory disk of your core resources. Um, you have this button here called channels, which will you know, allow you to you know, see the default channel that Kaleido creates for you. Uh, again, I mentioned that it's set to majority endorsement. So we needed that second peer, that second um, membership ID in order to collect you know, two out of three signatures. Um, but it's also really, really easy to create new channels, right? You can just click this add channel button, create a name, choose which memberships you want to participate inside of it, uh, and boom, now you have a second channel on Kaleido. Okay, so I'm gonna stop and turn it over to Jim um, for all of the really cool stuff around Fab Connect. Thanks, Nick. Uh, let me start sharing. Can you guys see the share? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Nick. Um, so that was great rundown uh, of all the uh, Clido support for Fabric. Um, so a brand new feature we just added um, as of the past two releases, um, that was released in about a month uh, ago, um, was uh, what we call Fab Connect. Uh, it's a component that is part of the Hyperledger uh, Firefly project. It's really um, a, a component that gives you two main features. Um, it allows you to interact with your Fabric network uh, through a RESTful API, rather than having to learn how to use the, uh, the heavyweight SDKs. So Nick showed you uh, the approach to use the SDKs with code um, <clears throat> to, uh, to talk to your Fabric network. Um, <clears throat> using Fab Connect, uh, you can use um, REST calls, for example, to, um, to talk to the CA, to create uh, and enroll a user. You just post to identities endpoint uh, to send transactions and post to transaction endpoint and so on and so forth. The other major feature this gives you is uh, subscribing to events. Um, with Fabric, uh, SDK, you can subscribe, uh, subscribe to events. The problem is if your application went away, uh, you will be missing events uh, because there's no um, mechanism to, to understand how many uh, events your client has consumed. Uh, it's just a constant stream. Uh, if the event, uh, if the client wasn't there, you missed the delivery of the event, uh, you just missed that event. Um, <clears throat> The event screen feature of FabConnect is uh, more elaborate so that if your client goes away, uh, the, the, the server side uh, of the event stream understands the client is not there and it holds up the delivery until the client is reconnected. Uh, and if um, um, there are uh, also Kafka-based um, uh, queuing, on the um, uh, injection of transactions. So <clears throat> let's say <clears throat> your application um, uh, in the particular hour of the day has really high volume of transactions. And if all of them are sent to the nodes directly, they're gonna overrun the node. Um, going through Kafka, make sure that <clears throat> they, number one, uh, they get put into the queue so they're never lost. Number two, they are going to, to be drip fed onto the node <clears throat> at a pace that the, that the node can handle. So it's not going to overrun uh, the node if the transaction volume is really high. <clears throat> so uh, for details of how the component is implemented, uh, you can look at the, uh, the uh, charts that we have uh, in the repository. It, it's under Hyperledger uh, Firefly uh, Fab Connect uh, repository. And if you uh, want to use it in your application and you'd like to see more features developed, uh, you're welcome to uh, create new uh, um, uh, enhancement reports in the issues. And we'd love to work with you to add those. Okay, so let's take a look at that in action. <clears throat> 
So as of um, release 1.0.50, um, which was released about a month ago, uh, your application uh, in your environment in uh, Kaleido uh, will have the FabConnect feature. So all the peers that you provision, uh, like uh, how uh, Nick showed you earlier, will have the uh, FabConnect component uh, built in. So I just got myself a uh, 1.0.51. So this release has, um, has the uh, uh, FabConnect in there. And I've already provisioned uh, two orderers and two peers. So let's take a look at the, um, <clears throat> uh, the FabConnect component and try to use it uh, to talk to uh, the Fabric uh, network and see how it works. So as with anything else, all the uh, endpoints on um, Kaleido resources uh, have protections. <clears throat> so you have to create um, a um, authentication credentials so your uh, application can use it to talk to the endpoint. So let's go ahead and create um, a pair of credentials. So now we have this endpoint now, um, we can use it to give ourselves uh, uh, the swagger. So once you've got the, uh, the full uh, host name with the credentials, just append API to the end of it in the browser. And then you will get this warning uh, because we've, you know, we went ahead and included the credentials in the uh, in the URL. The browser doesn't like that, so it's uh, taken off the uh, the credentials, and now we can access the whole uh, UI. So this is the entire uh, API surface uh, of FabConnect. By the way, um, this Swagger UI availability is not yet available uh, in the in the public. Um, release. I'm using a private release to show you. Uh, we're working on making this available, but all the APIs uh, that is shown here uh, is available to you. So if you want to use a client like curl or postman to hit those APIs, you can you can do that. But um, uh, I thought I, I would just use the, the built in uh, Swagger UI uh, to give you that, um, uh, that, that um, experience. Again, um, in the future release, uh, you will have this yourself as well. All right, so uh, first few of these are um, related to uh, working with Fabric CA. So uh, we can list what identities have been created. Um, okay, so sometimes you get a warning like that, uh, you just try again because <clears throat> the browser, uh, as I was showing earlier, uh, has, an, um, uh, has a complaint about the inclusion of the credentials. So just <clears throat> hit the execute again, and then we can see that there's one user that's already um, registered um, beyond the ones that are registered by default. Uh, this was something that I, um, uh, did earlier in preparation for the session, but we can go ahead and uh, get ourselves a new user. So we're gonna use the post endpoint. Uh, we'll give it user two. So as you know, this is the step that registers the user first. So you get back from Fabric CA a secret that then you can use to enroll this user. So we're going to uh, post to this endpoint and use the secret we just got from uh, the previous step and now call execute. So we have the user uh, now executed, um, uh, enrolled with Fabric CA. You can verify that by doing another query with uh, this endpoint that gets the uh, details of the user and it's going to return both the um, uh, the ID organization information but most importantly uh, the enrollment certificate 
So this shows that the user now has been registered. So you might be wondering, uh, where does this user exist? Uh, well, so it exists on FabConnect. So <clears throat> if you've worked with uh, Fabric SDKs, um, you know um, the client uh, SDK is responsible for managing, um, quote unquote, the wallet, uh, it, the, the file system uh, folder that has the uh, private key uh, and the enrollment certificate for that ident identity. And different SDKs have different formats uh, of that wallet. Uh, here, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the wallet is managed on your behalf. So <clears throat> the, the Fab Connect compo component built into the peer uh, that you provision in Clido uh, manages that wallet on your behalf. So we just ask the Fab Connect to enroll a user to identity. Uh, so now it exists uh, on Fab Connect in Clido. So now we've got the signing identity all ready to go. We can attempt to use it to submit some transactions. So this is then um, again, another endpoint where you just post to slash transactions endpoint and you give it the, the necessary payload. You can send it either synchronously, which means this call will be blocking until the transaction has been um, uh, uh, mined, replicated, and um, uh, validated by your peer node. Um, so the block, the request will be uh, blocking uh, until everything is done. So we'll try that first. You can also uh, do sync equals to false, where you will be given immediately back a identity work you can use to. Uh, to pull on the result uh, of that transaction later. So let's try synchronous first. Um, <clears throat> the signer, as we saw, will be user two. And then <clears throat> I've already done the preparation to have a channel deployed with, uh, with the asset transfer chain code, uh, same way that uh, Nick just showed you earlier. So it's gonna be on the default channel if I can type and then the chain code is asset transfer. So we'll call create asset <clears throat> and then it's going to take the list of arguments um, that I have saved over here. Okay, so <clears throat> Uh, in it will be false. This is a invocation of the transaction rather than initialization of the... Okay, so um, it shows you, uh, you see that uh, the, the response of the API makes sure that if there is any issues in the back end, uh, it'll uh, display the, uh, the problem uh, to you. So this is now showing that both peers are giving uh, a, an error saying this asset already exists. So you can use the response uh, and, and the error messaging there to determine what your step should be next. So let's go ahead and give it a new asset ID. And this time it's uh, a successful uh, um, transaction. We can see that the status is valid and here's the transaction ID. And if we take that ID, uh, there is another endpoint that allows you to query for details of a transaction. Um, <clears throat> because this is GET, you don't get any uh, payloads. You have to specify the channel um, in a query parameter. So it's called fly dash uh, channel. It's going to be default channel. And fly signer is going to be user two. So here um, you get the full um, details of that transaction uh, by that ID. Um, <clears throat> so you can see in the in both the uh, input payload as well as the response payload um, of Farfly, you get a general structure where there's a header 
and there's a details um, the details section. So the header gives you some metadata information, uh, the, the internal ID, um, uh, the type of the message, some uh, timestamps, um, and then the, the result uh, portion of the payload gives you the, the actual result uh, for that request. Okay, so uh, with just a few API calls, now we've gone sort of through a, a full life cycle of um, uh, enrolling a signing identity, sending some transactions to Fabric, uh, looking at the transaction results and query for, uh, for the transaction details. So any uh, web developers that doesn't necessarily know anything about Fabric can use this, uh, this API uh, to talk to a Fabric network. So we expect this to be uh, really, uh, really useful to get uh, Fabric adoption within your enterprise um, even faster. So certainly a lot of our customers have, um, have found this very useful. Okay. so. That was sending transactions. Well, what about queries? So we have another endpoint, uh, just simply slash query, that you can call to um, to call a query uh, endpoint on your uh, on your smart contract. So <clears throat> asset transfer uh, has a few uh, query only uh, methods. So one of them was um, get all assets that returns all the assets that's being created so far. So again, the signer is gonna be user two, channel is default channel, chain code is asset transfer. Okay, it doesn't really need any arguments, just execute. So you can see um, both, both assets are returned one and two. Okay, so now I want to show you uh, the asynchronous way of sending sending transactions. Again, because transaction transaction cycle can be can be long compared to database calls. Um, often applications would like to uh, use a async uh, style of uh, API, so they don't have to wait uh, for the transaction to be completed. So we're going to set the transaction uh, flag to be a sync equals to false. And then let's go ahead and send another transaction with a new asset ID. OK, as you can see, it returns immediately with an ID. And if you take this ID and then ask WebConnect, what is the receipt, which is the result of that transaction? Initially, it may return uh, return null uh, if the transaction hasn't been uh, completed. But now the transaction has already been completed. So uh, this receipt uh, gives you the same payload that we saw earlier with the sync calls um, of the ID that you can use uh, to query for the details and the status, which is valid. So. Uh, if you want to um, use a asynchronous uh, API call, you can you can just set uh, sync to false and and pull on the on the result later. So this is uh, just the side of the API on the front end. So sending stuff to Fabric and querying results. Um, this is how you do it. Um, you may have noticed that I have this other tab that has these counters ticking. This is the, uh, the event stream side of things for uh, as far as the um, uh, APIs available. So uh, as you saw over here, um, <clears throat> you can subscribe to uh, events uh, from uh, uh, Fab Connect, which relays all the events that you're interested in from, Fab, uh, uh, from Fabric nodes to you through two uh, different channels. Uh, we need to upgrade the, update the chart here. It supports both WebSocket uh, as well as webhooks. So this is an example of a webhook um, uh, uh, stream. So uh, you can see this was the one that we uh, 
uh, created earlier. This was another one that we just created. Both were delivered to my uh, to my webhook endpoint. So I'm using uh, this site uh, to show the uh, the post results. So both events were delivered to me uh, through webhook because um, before the session, I've already um, I've already um, created this uh, webhook uh, subscription. So to create a event stream, it's really uh, two simple calls. First of all, you need to create an event stream. Uh, the, the event stream <clears throat> can be either webhook based or WebSocket. I'll show you how to create a WebSocket later. So for webhook, you just give it the URL. And if the URL endpoint is something running on your laptop uh, you, <clears throat> that you don't have um, uh, proper TLS certificates, uh, you can specify this. So uh, Fact Connect will skip verifying uh, for TLS uh, certificates. But if it's a, an official website, then you, you don't have to uh, skip this step. You create the event stream. So event stream is sort of a big pipe that can be shared by many clients. Um, this pipe is gonna be webhook based. Uh, now, who is listening on the you know, payloads flowing through this pipe is determined by subscriptions. To create a subscription, you specify the, uh, the target stream that you're going to listen on. So that's the stream ID that we created above here. And then you tell it what kind of events you are in interested in. So from block zero uh, and payload type will be um, uh, a, a JSON payload. And <clears throat> for the block, for the filter, you can filter on uh, block type. So transaction is one. Um, you can also listen on uh, config or config update uh, type of blocks. Um, <clears throat> you can specify optionally your target chain code ID and then uh, uh, use a regular expression to filter on event names. Uh, or you can just skip them if you just want all events from all blocks. So because I set it up this way, uh, my event stream has delivered uh, all these transactions. Uh, I think it started from, from here. So it started from block number five because all previous four blocks were config um, uh, type of blocks that you know, sets up the channel and sets up the membership of the channel. So the first endorser uh, transaction block started with number five and you can see five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, each, uh, each transaction ends up in their own block because um, the transaction rate is rather low and RAF is, has really fast uh, block cycles. But if you have a pretty fast uh, uh, injection rate, you may have multiple transactions in a single block. So I've got uh, all these blocks delivered to me. So now let's go ahead and create uh, another um, event stream uh, for WebSocket. So creating a WebSocket, it's, it's uh, simpler than um, uh, webhooks. So we just tell it, um, what's my topic? Again, because this is, um, this is setting up a pipe, um, the pipe needs to have sort of a, um, a, a contract uh, with the client. So the client knows what is the, uh, what is the, content I'm interested in when I'm using this web, WebSocket um, pipe. So <clears throat> you give it a, um, a topic that uh, you decide, then uh, the client later on uh, will have to uh, specify the same topic in order to uh, connect to this, to this string. Okay, so we went ahead and created um, the string. Now let's create the subscription. Specify the stream ID. Again, the channel will be default channel. 
user, uh, user, uh, okay. I think for this node, uh, we're using user one. Okay, uh, one or two, both are okay. We'll go ahead and use user two. From block zero, um, then payload type is string wide JSON. Um, it'll just be transaction. I'm gonna listen to all transaction uh, blocks, uh, no further filtering. And let's go ahead and create this. Okay, so now we have a subscription. So now let's go ahead and connect from our client to that subscription. Okay, so um, <clears throat> as I showed you earlier, from your um, from your uh, node endpoint, you can create uh, this um, authenticated uh, endpoint. So make sure uh, you get the uh, so on every peer there are different endpoints. Um, make sure you get the one that has the Clido uh, Connect label. So I'll go ahead and copy this one. And then from here, I'm gonna use uh, WSCAT as my client. To subscribe to the uh, event stream, you just append WS to the end of the host name. So now I'm connected. Remember that, <clears throat> I've already subscribed uh, to <coughs> topic text one. Now, as a client, I wanna tell the server, I'm the client that's interested in test one. So as soon as you subscribe to test one from the client, you start getting um, transac uh, transaction events de uh, delivered to you. So this is the response uh, from the server. Uh, because the server now uh, knows that you are interested in uh, test one uh, as the topic for all events tied to that topic, it's going to be delivered to you. Um, <clears throat> you have to acknowledge every delivery before the server gives you the next um, transaction. So you can see the next transaction is uh, delivered to you as soon as you acknowledge the last one. Then let's acknowledge again until we have all the uh, all the uh, transactions delivered to us. Okay, so 11, let's see if we have more. Okay, no more. The last acknowledge, uh, uh, there's no more uh, transactions. And now let's see if we um, submit one more transaction we should see more deliveries. Okay, so here we go, 4 Yep, indeed. Uh, now we have 0,4. Um, <coughs> you may be wondering what is in, what's in the, the payload. So the payload is actually uh, just a byte array, <coughs> sorry. Um, <clears throat> see, it's going to be, um, A64 encoded, um, JSON payload. So that's, that's the, the payload that, <clears throat> uh, smart, the smart contract added to the event. And it's base uh, 64 encoded as it goes through the stream. Um, when I created the <clears throat> when I created the subscription um, over over here, um, Stringified JSON. Um, the payload type is supposed to tell the server to decode uh, the JSON string. Uh, I must have given the wrong uh, value. So let's see if we. So you can review the schema uh, 
by going to the schema tab, the payload type is, okay, so we use the, the wrong version of the value. It's a, a lowercase s, not uh, uppercase s. If we had specified this correctly, then instead of giving us the, the ugly looking uh, payload like this, it would have been um, expanded, uh, decoded into a JSON structure. So that's just a convenience uh, convenience for you. So let's go ahead and acknowledge that. In the meanwhile, uh, since we have the other listener going on uh, from the other node uh, with webhook, uh, this webhook also got uh, the same event. So both clients had the same event over to them, one through web, web uh, socket, the other through webhook. All right, so I think this is, um, all I'd like to show you, uh, there's a couple other miscellaneous uh, endpoints that are self-explanatory. I'm not gonna uh, show them here, uh, given that we're running out of time. And uh, thank you for your patience. Um, I guess we may spend a few minutes for questions. Yeah, if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand. We can unmute you, throw it into the chat, um, or what I'll do if you know folks want to noodle on their questions a bit, um, you can reach out to us uh, at support at kaleido.io, which I've put into the chat. Uh, if you have questions more on kind of like the commercial level, uh, you can contact sales at kaleido.io as well. Um, and we can, we're happy to help you and talk through this. Uh, that was awesome, by the way, Jim. This is one, one of the cooler things I've seen. And Fabric is so complex that, you know, this really kind of makes life easier for developers. So I um, hope everyone enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, don't see any questions. So uh, I think we can wrap up. I'll just say thank you so much um, to everyone that attended. Big thanks to Jim for showing out this bleeding edge Fab Connect stuff. And uh, this will be recorded. We'll, we'll send it out if you need a refresher on any of those APIs or endpoints. Um, and please stay tuned. We'll, we'll be re, you know, revamping these Tech Tuesdays. And um, a lot of new exciting things are coming to Clido in, in 2022. So uh, please stay tuned. Uh, with that, I think we can wrap it. So one final thank you to Jim and all the attendees. And I hope everyone has a wonderful Tuesday.